Hello, Georgia Gang Cars here. And today I wanted to do a video on how to go shopping for art supplies. What should you get and why? So let's get started. So mostly my students will ask me, what should I paint? Should I paint with oils, acrylics, watercolors? And I say basically that's a personal decision up to you. Sometimes uh, the way that I tell students to figure that out, right, is to also think about your lifestyle. So sometimes a student might have a space that's very small. They don't have any ventilation. They might have a roommate that's a doormate that's right close near them where they have their beds are almost touching. Um, they might have to share an apartment with somebody or a bedroom. And they don't have that much space to paint. So oils in that situation might not be great for them, especially if they're taking an online class. Also, if they don't have places to store it, so if they're at home, where are they going to be able to paint? Um, the other thing is if they have children and they don't have the paints where they can store them safely or if they have like a, a cat that's getting into their box or whatever, they might want to think about do they have enough space where they can be in a little bit in isolation for a while where they're painting um, and they're not going to, it's not going to be hazardous to a child or to an animal. Um, the next thing that you want to think about is not only your environment, and I did a whole video on how to set up a safe studio space at home. The other thing you want to think about besides um, your environment when you're painting is what are you attracted to? Are you attracted to texture? Because if you're attracted to texture, you might enjoy oils and acrylics, or even gouache. If you like um, things that are very uh, transparent, you might like something or that doesn't have a lot of texture, you might be more attracted to watercolors. If you want something that uh, is not as messy, you might be more attracted to watercolors. Watercolors are an easy paint that clean, cleans up very well if you get it on your hands or your clothing, where it takes a little bit more of effort to take out the oils and acrylic out of your clothing. But it can be done, um, and they spell, sell special solvents at the store um, that can do that. So you just have to ask yourself that. That's the next question. Okay, so the way I tell students is go to a museum. Look at the paintings. See which one you're attracted to. Maybe you're more attracted to oils. Oils tend to be very shiny, and when they dry, they can also have that varnish where acrylics will dry a lot flatter. Um, oils will stay wet for a longer amount of time, so if you want to mix them, if, say, your painting is dry, you know, you're painting, and next week you want to go back into your painting, your painting will probably not be dry. But with acrylics, they will dry by the time you finish the session. So that means you'll have to remix the colors if you want to reblend. Um, that can be uh, difficult until you learn how to use the paint, but um, in, it can also be difficult with the oils if they stay wet because you have to learn how to do varnishes and how to control your amount of paint so you don't put too much paint on the canvas where it becomes messy and muddy. So they both have their positive and negative um, impact, but it's best to look through a magazine, better off your laptop, and best of all, go to the museum and look at those paintings and see which ones you like, and choose the one that best fits your lifestyle, okay? Um, a lot of students, sometimes they've painted with oils and they want to try acrylics, and they've painted with acrylics and they want to try oils or watercolors. Um, so, and I'd also watch videos and see the process so you can see um, if you like the final result of what the paint does, because they're all different properties. Okay, now that you've figured that out, the next thing you have to think about is what colors do you need? So, I, if you're on a budget, I tell students to buy six colors, and they are tea white, so that's the color of typing paper. They also have, uh, before I say that, I have to say this, depending on which um, brand that you choose, so which company that you're going to buy the paint from, it's going to be different. So usually, for an example, a cadmium yellow, right? A cad yellow is always the same color, but that's not always the case. 
because sometimes certain companies dilute the paint where it's, you know, it's not as strong. They don't have as much pigment in it. So you could buy uh, a paint by another company with the same name and the color will look different. Um, what paints do are they usually have swatches on them. So for example, this paint, it has the color on the outside. But when you're shopping for a paint, you have to make sure that when you're opening the tube that the color matches the swatch. Because sometimes some companies don't do that as well. Okay, so you might get the tube home and you thought that you had a dark green and it's really lighter. So they do have um, paint where you can see the color through the tube, right? You'll see a lot of paints like this where you can see the color through the tube. And that's helpful because you know the color inside. But those tubes also do not do really well if you leave them um, in the sun, you know, or in uh, very, very cold conditions. Okay, because a lot of tubes that are coated, you'll see a lot of, you know, paints that come in these kind of tubes, um, they work better with the temperature well because the light is not going through the paint. So there's all these, there's positives and negatives of, of each side. Um, so that's the first thing. So when you're looking at the colors, you have to just make sure that no matter if it's a tube that where it's all colored and it just has a swatch, or if it's a tube that you can see through it, is it the color that you want? So now let's talk about the colors. Okay, so the first color would be tea white. So that's just white, the color of typing paper. That's pretty simple. And I would not get a pearl white, pearl white would be like a necklace, like if you had a pearl necklace. You don't want that. It's very iridescent. Um, the next color would be your yellow, and they have different kind of yellows. Lemon yellow, Hansa yellow, cad yellow. Basically, I, you know, the cads, they're very popular, but sometimes, you know, because of the solvents sometimes in the paints now, they're trying to make them a little bit more um, safer. Um, because of the metals in the paints in certain cats. So the thing is, you know, get, you can get a safe color yellow. Sometimes they have like primary yellows. But just notice that when I get a yellow, I like to get a color that is closest and strongest to his pigment. What does that mean? If I see two yellows, right, I'm going to pick out the yellow that is the brightest. Okay. And the reason why, because if I get a yellow that is a little bit lighter like this one, this one is a little bit more pure, and this one is, I'm trying to cover the name here, this one's very diluted. You see how this is more like a, it gets a little bit brown. If you choose the pure yellow, you're always better off because you can make it darker or lighter. But if you choose a lighter yellow, like a lemon yellow, or a, a very light Hansa yellow, you're, you have a harder time making that paint darker and making it obviously a true yellow. So it's better to go with the strong pigments and the pure pigments. So if I saw a red, I would not, I would get, you know, like an apple red compared to getting a rose red or something that was very light mixed with a lot of white or tint because I can never get a very good brown, a strong brown. Okay, so pure colors. So if you knew nothing about the color, just think of the pure bright color that you want of each color, not diluted and uh, not too dark or not too light, the true color, the true hue. And you also see hues when you go shopping for colors. You'll say, what is a hue? Well, it's not actually the color, it's a hue of that. And those paints, of course, will be cheaper because of the, the pigments that they put inside. The other thing um, that you'll see is you'll see light fastness of a color, or you'll see that the color is sometimes series one, two, and three. That might mean that it has less pigment. It might, you know, not be as the pure color as the strongest pigment. Sometimes you'll see those numbers and it will mean thickness, like the body, the paint will be a heavy body. So if you want a heavy body paint, you would choose a heavy body paint uh, color. For an example, you might see, you know, an apple crimson, that um, an apple um, with ultramarine blue, let's say, an ultramarine blue, and it might be a little bit thicker, you know, compared to another paint that is more thinner, like a temper paint. So in my uh, situation, when I'm shopping with paints, I always go with a thicker paint. Because a thicker paint, you can dilute to make thinner. But once it's thinner, it's a little bit harder to make it thicker, okay? So, T white is your titanium white. That's the first color. The second one is the yellow. 
you know, I, I have the cat or you can just have, sometimes they'll call it, you know, like a primary yellow, okay? Um, you would need a red. And when I say red, I tell students to think of the color of fire engine, right? So they have, you know, an apple kind of red, that kind of crimson red that they call it. Um, it's different from a lizard crimson. It's not as dark. It's, it's brighter, obviously. It's like a fire engine red. So that's the color that you would want. You can see, you see how this looks a little pink, right? So you want it to look a little bit more red, right? Or bright red. So the other thing that you would want to do is the next color that you would choose would be a green. And usually I would choose a phthalo green. So this is a darker green. And the reason why I like the darker green is I can have my darker green and I can combine it with my yellow. And I can get a lighter yellow or if I add less yellow, I can get this color wheel primary green. But if I get this primary green, it's a little bit harder to get the phthalo dark green. So I like having a darker color because I have more of a variation. Um, the other thing that um, you can do is the next color. So we have our tea white, right? We have our yellow, our primary yellow or our cad yellow. We have our, uh, we have our red, our napple red, crimson, they would call it. Um, sometimes they have primary red. Again, it depends on the company. And the next color, you have your dark phthalo green. If you want to, you know, you can get the green that is just the regular uh, primary kind of green with the color wheel. But again, I showed you why I prefer getting a dark phthalo green because you can make it lighter. And you can get an ultramarine blue, a cobalt blue, or a Prussian blue. I prefer the ultramarine blue for versatility. And um, then you can you don't have to buy a purple. You can make the purple with your blue and your red. And then lastly, you can get a um, Mars black or an ivory black. The ivory black is softer. So it depends on if you want it a little bit darker or lighter. Um, I prefer, sometimes you don't even have to buy black because you can mix the colors as far as mixing, you know, a red and then your green and your blues and you can make it really dark, whereas it was a really dark brown, almost black. So you really don't need to buy the black unless you want a pure black. If you wanted a pure dark black, you really want to go for a Mars over an ivory. So again, your tea whites, your yellows, uh, your reds, your greens, and your blues, okay? And then other colors that you could get for fun would be a purple. Sometimes I like to like, you know, I make my purple, but then sometimes I'll go, okay, I'll go out and get a dioxin purple because it's really, really bright and it's dark, but it's, it's luminous. And then uh, you can also go out and get browns, but you can make your brown. I, um, as far as I'll show you, my raw umber here, you can make this from the red and the green that you have. Um, you can lighten the red and the green with a little bit of yellow, and you can make um, this wonderful uh, burnt sienna, right? You can have an orange and a green and make this color. So again, if you just buy six colors, you can make all the other colors. I actually um, wrote a book looking for it now. <laughs> I actually wrote a book on mixing all of the colors. So it gives you step by step all the colors that you would need to uh, to attain. Uh, six colors can make you about 500 colors and I teach a class on that and I also wrote another book I have a couple of books for each class that I teach, but this is the Painting for Everyone book, and this is all of the materials that you would need uh, for mixing and painting with acrylics, oils, and watercolors. So that's a little bit about the paints. Now um, I'm going to talk to you about the quality of the paint. So again, remember we talked about paints and tubes and paints that you might see um, in a smaller tube, but the color is showing through the tube. The first thing that you have to realize is that what do you want? A thicker paint. I prefer a thicker paint because if I open the tube and I turn the paint up like this, 
it's not coming out. It's a very good thick quality paint. And I look for that in watercolors, oils, and acrylics if I'm buying a tube kind of paint. Okay, and I want a thick quality paint so I can thin it. There are, if you buy a paint in acrylics that is not as thick as you want and it's very fluid and watery, you can add something called acrylic gel medium to the paint to make it a little bit thicker. But you can only add 25% of it because if you add equal amount of that acrylic gel medium to the paint, it's just going to make the paint thin out and you're not going to have the color anymore. You want to keep the thickness of the color. So um, that's something that I would look for um, in any of the paints. Um, the next thing that I want to, so that's acrylics and oils. Okay, those are the colors. Um, like I said, you can go out and treat yourself to a brown or all those colors, but it's fun. It's, best, it's better to make them because then you know what's inside of them. The next thing that you have to think about is for watercolors. Are, are you going to buy the tube or are you going to buy the well? So a lot of watercolors, they come in a tube, and I'll show you what they look like right now, or they come in a well. So hold on. Okay, so with watercolors, they come much smaller. All right, so I'll show you. They come in these little tiny sets. And the reason why they come in less amount is because you don't need as much paint. You only need a smaller amount. So watercolors will come in a little small tube like this. You're not being, you know, cheated and getting less of a paint. It's just that uh, you don't need as much paint with the watercolors. The other thing that watercolors come in, or sometimes they have watercolor pencils, and those are pencils that you can draw with. So you can draw literally with the pencil and use your brush to take out the color. So sometimes students love that because they're not messy at all. So you have these wonderful watercolor pencils, and I did a whole video on this, where you can draw with the watercolor pencil and you can bring out the color and you don't have to, uh, they're not messy at all, obviously. You just need a good pencil sharpener. Um, so that could be the way to go. So they do sell watercolor pencils, and they do come um, in a pack, or you can get the watercolor in the old-fashioned well, or you can get the watercolor in the tube. Um, the difference with the watercolors that come in the tube is they're a little bit more versatile because you can use them thicker or thinner where the brush, you, um, where the pencil, they'll be a lot thinner because the paint will not be as thick, okay? Um, so now let's move on to the difference uh, between the brushes. So I tell students when going shopping for a good brush, your brush is your extra hand. You have to have an amazing brush. You cannot really get by with a cheap brush, but you can get by with a student quality brush. And you have to decide what kind of painting do you want to do. If you want the painting to look very realistic and you want hardly um, no brush strokes showing, you want it very smooth, you would probably get a synthetic brush. And synthetic brushes, they'll come in white. Or they'll come in now this kind of like sable kind of color here. And they're very, this one is off-white because I, <laughs> I've been painting with it. But uh, it's usually a very, let's see, I have one that hasn't been used here. You know, and it's synthetic, okay? But the thing is with the synthetic brushes, they, as far as holding the weight of the water, you don't need to use as much water with them if you're using acrylics. Or if you're using oils, you don't need to use as much turp or uh, linseed oil. They're very, uh, they're very soft and they'll make your paintings very smooth and realistic. If you lots, lots, lots of texture, you probably want to go with a rougher brush. So this is um, a bristle brush. It's a number 12 and it happens to be a flat. And you can see how rough the bristles are. It's real, it's actually hog hair. Um, which they makes the student grade uh, brushes from. So you really need to ask yourself what kind. Do you want more like a nylon kind of brush? You know, the synthetic kind of brush? Or do you want like your old-fashioned bristle brushes? You can also go for a fan brush. And this is kind of shaped like a fan. And I did a whole video on fan brushes and how um, 
different strokes that you can use with them. They're great for blending. They're great for making lines and uh, blending as far as also making clouds in the sky uh, and also for shrubbery for plants. So bristle brush uh, and a fan brush is pretty cool. And then they have other brush. Now, once you decide what kind of brush you want, if you want for oils and acrylics, if you want synthetic, or if you want real natural hair, like a bristle hair brush, a thicker brush, once you decide that, you have to decide the sizes. So usually, I'll look at the size of my canvas, and if I have a small canvas, I will have smaller brushes. But I need a range of brushes going from large to medium to very small. And the same for my large canvas. If I have a six foot canvas, I still need a range of brushes going from large to medium to small. So what I do is I, when I go shopping for a brush, I look at the length. Watercolor brushes, of course, will be shorter in length. But oils and acrylics, they'll be a little bit longer, right? And the handle is good to have a really long handle because it makes it more versatile. So you can hold the brush at the end for a very large stroke. You can hold it in the middle for a very a medium stroke or at the end for something that's a little bit more pressure and has more precision. So it, the longer is a little bit better for the oils and acrylics. Um, you do have round brushes and I did a whole video of how the round brushes work, um, how you can um, dip them into your paint and make three or four strokes at once. They're great for doing um, landscapes as far as doing trees and shrubbery. Um, they're great for clouds. They're great for covering large surfaces. But the other thing is, remember, it's round. So when you're pressing on that brush, it has less flexibility. It's still going to stay in that shape. Where when you have a brush that is a flat, it looks like a square, you see how it bends out? When it touches the canvas, it flattens out. And this flattens out. So you can cover a larger amount of space. And I did a whole brush, uh, a whole series on, um, or in my class, we do um, washes with, you know, um, a regular, uh, what you would call a flat versus a round. So you get the idea of the properties of both of them, okay? But if you're just looking for uh, a brush, you're basically, I would go with a larger brush and probably a larger flat. And what I have students do is they usually buy a wash brush. So a wash brush will cover the canvas. This is a very large brush. This is synthetic. And this is um, natural hair. Okay, and we talked about the difference with that. But these work for washes is just to cover the canvas very fast. If you had to do a wash on your canvas and cover the whole canvas with this little small brush, you might be here all day, right? And a wash is basically just a translucent kind of layer with uh, less paint and more of your solvent. So if it was acrylics, it would be more water, right? And less paint. And for oils, it would be you know, more of your turp and uh, less of the paint. But so I usually have a really large brush for that and I use, you know, a brush for putting on the gesso and the gesso is the white stuff that goes on top of the canvas when you buy a canvas. So I'll show you. When you buy a canvas, if you see the corners of this canvas, this white stuff is an acrylic based polymer paint and they just put it on top because canvases are just cotton duck that's been stretched. So it's a piece of cotton that's been treated. And if you look at it real close, you can see the better the weave, the tighter the weave, the better the, the type of canvas because the paint won't go through. But what they do is they put this coating of gesso on top. So when you paint on top, your paint just goes directly on the canvas and the, the brush slides a little bit easier because if it didn't have this coating, it would drag. So that's why they put it, and this is just kind of stretched around. So um, anyway, this that uh, large brush that I just showed you, your brush for your wash, you could also use for your gesso. You could get a separate brush if you wanted to gesso your canvas. It's not required if you bought a store-bought canvas that already has the gesso on it. Okay? So for as far as from small to medium large, we'd have a large brush. You have a medium brush, and I'll show you. If I had three or four brushes, these are the sizes that I might have. And 
Okay. So I have a little small brush, which is a round brush. It's coming to a point. And I have another brush here. It's a little round. This one is a flat. I have another one in between. And I'll discuss the brushes for you. For you. So we already discussed the round and the flat brush. You do want to discuss the rigor brush. And those are the brushes, again, that were elongated and they're shaped to a point. Those are really good because I think that they're excellent for like fine detail and lines and making straight lettering. Some people will call them, it's like a liner brush where you can make these same lines. Um, other brushes that you might think about is a nylon. We talked about that, the sable. It's a soft brush. It's an excellent brush for oils and acrylics. Um, it has a lot of work if you want to do a lot of detail. They also have a really good lifespan. So um, not all brushes have the same kind of lifespan, obviously. And then they have the angled brushes. Those brushes kind of come to a point at an angle. And they're a little bit more uh, soft. They're synthetic. They're good for angles, obviously, and landscapes. That's why they call it an angle brush. Um, and you could have a bright brush. That's a good brush for texture and a pastel. It has shorter hairs, but it's, it's good control. So the thing is, when you're shopping for the brushes, most of them, I have my um, filbert. I definitely have. Um, my liner or my rigger brush, some brush that's going to come to a point. You can buy the brushes in the pack where they'll give you all those brushes for medium, um, large, uh, small, medium, and large, or you can buy them separately. If you buy them separately, they're more expensive because they're more detailed. So uh, again, you need a small brush, usually a liner or a rigger, you know, you need, need your uh, filbert. And um, the other brushes that we kind of just discussed as far as the difference between the flat and the round brushes. Um, when you're using watercolors, it's a little bit different. They'll have brushes. You'll need a mop brush. You'll need a cat's tongue because that's a very good brush. It kind of um, it makes fine lines and strokes and it's good for washes and covering large areas. So it's more versatile. Um, you'll need um, I showed you what a hack was. We had a hack brush, and that was good for the background washes. Um, you could have a sumi brush. That's for drawing the inks, if you were using inks, you know. Sometimes students will use, uh, they might use watercolor, and then they might combine it with an ink. Now, I just, now, now, once you have the brushes that you need, you have to think, and I will state, the oils and acrylic brushes, you can use the same brush for an oil and acrylic painting, but you can never mix them. In other words, if you're working with acrylics, you can't turn around and use that brush with oils. I would use a separate brush, okay? But watercolors have their own type of brushes. Again, they have their special mop hair, mop hair brushes. They have special cat's tongue. They have special brushes that hold the weight of the watercolor. So you need those brushes for watercolors. You cannot use an oil or acrylic brush for watercolors. Um, the other thing that you might do is you think about the type of hairs. So I showed you already the hog hair for the acrylic oil. You know, we have the red sable. That's that the color that I showed you for uh, oils and acrylics. You have a black sable brush, which is really good for oils. And we also have ox hair, which is good for uh, oils and acrylics. So those are things that you would definitely need. So you need your brushes from small to medium large. You need your six colors. You can buy more colors if you want, right? And that's the way you would decide which color that you want and which brush that you want. When I look for brushes, again, I look for good quality hair. I make sure that the hair goes all the way into the furrow where it's tightened, where the hairs don't come out. And for acrylics and oils, a longer uh, brush. Uh, handle okay um and again you know if i had to choose just a couple of brushes i might have an angel bright that's good for shading i'd have the fan brush which i showed you it's like the little fan i'd have a bright brush it makes strong uh, strokes i'd have a flat brush a round brush which i showed you the round shape and a filbert because it's good for blending um, and acts like a flat and a round brush um, so the thing, last thing is the brush size. The brush sizes are sometimes important, but sometimes they're not. Because if you go through a different manufacturer, 
the brush size could be different for that manufacturer. In other words, a number two made in Germany might be a different size than a number uh, two made in, um, you know, uh, I don't know, Italy or something or the United States. So you just want to look at the size of the brush too in reference to your canvas. Now, lastly, what kind of canvases do you need? Okay, so you can buy a store-bought canvas, which is the one that I showed you that is pre-gessoed. They have museum board now. It's ready to paint on. They have a canvas that's made out of wood. So it's just wood and you can paint directly on top of it. And they also um, have canvases that you can stretch yourself, which means that you would buy the uh, the canvas and you would have to stretch it yourself on the stretcher bars and in order to do that you would have to buy the canvas and then you need to buy yourself a canvas plier so um do a little bit of research don't make it too stressful just say do i want to paint what medium do i want to paint in you know what space do i have at home and look at my video for setting up a studio space um, i think acrylics are easy if you have a smaller space or watercolors, um, oils are wonderful too, but they'll need, they just require a little bit more of solvents that you would have to buy. You have to buy linseed oils with them. You have to buy turpentine, um, or turpen, I'm sorry, turpentine with them. Um, some students do buy, you know, turpentine, the odorless turpentine, uh, or turpentine. You have to uh, buy mixers with them. You can buy varnishes that you add to the oils. It's just a little bit more difficult. And you don't have to get everything that's toxic these days. They have wonderful paints that you can buy with oils, like uh, different types of linseed oils, walnut oils, sunflower oils. And I'll do a whole video separately on just oil paints and those, uh, those solvents. But again, if you're painting with oils, you just need a linseed oil, um, uh, your regular paints and you'll need a turp. Um, you might have a fast drying agent um, that you want to put with the oils if you like a alkyd if you wanted the oils to dry fast and for acrylics you might have a medium that you extend it. It's called an extender so your uh, acrylics would stay wetter for a long amount of time. So I hope to see you in class and I'll make a shorter version of this video um, uh, very soon. Okay, ciao.